Good morning. It's me, Mikey Pipes. Today is Friday. I love Friday. Friday, November 5th. Is it the 5th? It's the 5th. And I have someone riding along with me today. We won't show his face yet. We'll see. You've reached your destination. But I just reached my destination. The guy's got noise coming from his boiler. And that's the house. Oh, God. We're in Freeport. Stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss it. Uh, you know, I looked up some information from like on heatinghelp.com. Okay. Great, great source yeah, of information, yeah. especially the wall yeah. on heatinghelp.com. That's Dan Hollihan, yeah, by the way. It's the guy yeah. who wrote the Lost Art of Steam Heat. Yeah. And uh, the book, uh, We've Got Steam Heat, that I recommend yeah, to a lot yeah, of people. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, so, yeah, he's very, very knowledgeable. So, you know, I, from reading, uh, you know, on the website, uh, it looks like, you know, um, uh, that tea coming off from the heart purple it has too much of a warmth. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so it could be maybe a Y fitting. It could be a Y fitting or it could, this, this elbow should be a street elbow and it goes right into this tea because you don't, you don't want too much of a gap there. Yeah. So when we, like, I pipe in steam boilers, you know, I use, I don't use copper. I use, you know, threaded black pipe, but I always use a shoulder. Okay. Well, actually, no, sorry, a close nipple here. Right. Because in the manual, if you read the manual, again, you can have a Y fitting there or a close or shoulder yeah. nipple. That's what yeah. Burnham recommends. So I, I, I've never put, put, put a Y in. I've always put in, you know, the, like a two by inch and a quarter black you know, steam tea there with a, a close nipple and then an elbow pointing down and then put the drain in the bottom, what have you. <laughs> they used... I mean, so the, the setup was like that when, when we purchased the house two years, three years ago? This is a little odd, though, how what? it's pitched down here. Correct. The boiler does not look level. It looks like it's Oh, wow. Yeah, it's not sitting level. This side, they didn't install it on a level base. <laughs> oh, man. But it's been installed since 2013. All right, so you're hearing water hammer. So it basically sounds like someone's taking a pipe wrench to the pipes. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't hear anymore because I, I guess I lowered the pressure uh, setting, the differential. Okay. How hot was it? What was it up before? But... Uh, before it was higher than 1.5. Okay. But now it's like under 1.5. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. yeah. It's good. Maybe an extra sight glass but, there, very nice. But, 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 but you're going to have to cut that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that... I don't even know what pipe that is. That's like an inch and a quarter, right? This? Yeah. This is inch and a quarter. Yeah, like I was reading the manual. It says inch and a half minimum. Yeah, so I normally take two inch... Right, and mm -hmm. come around and go back to the boiler in two inch. Yeah, so the equalizer is also two inch. Yeah. This going back to there. Here they bush down to inch and a quarter coming out of the bottom left corner of the boiler and connected that way. No drain though on the yeah. wet return. You know, one day you'll, you'll add one. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I wanted you guys to uh, replace that with a you know, oh, what's up with this? Come on. <laughs> what's up with this vent pipe for your water heater? You want to kill your family? <laughs> you do put that in yourself. Well, I had to replace the water heater. I know, and you got you should have got a low boy. I had a, a fifty gallon, uh, forty gallon. And, and this one's before. taller. And this one's taller. And you now now you. But it works. <laughs> it works. I checked. You checked? Yeah. It's been on for like a year now. Let's see if I feel any exhaust with my hand there. All right. Yeah, Home Depot special. Oh, come on. What is this? Uh, so, so I, I put in a uh, hot water uh, circulation system. With a cast iron circulator. That's what they had. That's, leaching, the <laughs> that's leaching cast iron into your, your drinking water. Yeah, but well, I mean, I don't drink the hot water. <laughs> <laughs> you don't drink the hot water. Oh, my God. I hear you. I know, but still, you're you're contaminating the the um, your oh you did put a flow check in there. You are contaminating though your the the potable water though. 
I have a I have a customer that I'll tell you a quick little story. Mm-hmm. You'll like to appreciate the story. I have a customer who loves coffee. Old Italian guy. He's probably watching this video right now, right? Mm-hmm. His name is Sam. And I have this customer known for many, many years. He loves coffee. He has these ridiculously expensive coffee machines in his house, all over his house. He also has them in his office as well, the way he works, right? Mm-hmm. And one day he asked me to change the filter, the water filter for one of his coffee machines, mm-hmm. right? In his kitchen. I open up the cabinet. I see a cast iron boiler pressure reducing valve that they're using on the water line that feeds his coffee machine. Because this is like an imported coffee machine from, from Italy, right? And it needs a lower pressure. Mm-hmm. So they, they put a boiler pressure reducing valve in. Mm-hmm. I, I look at him, I'm like, what the hell is this? Like, you're like you're killing yourself. Like, with, you're basically drinking iron. He, his turn, he turns white as a ghost. He sits down in the chair and he goes, let me tell you a story. And he tells me a story that for years, since he put this thing in, he didn't put the two and two together. There's your noise again. For years, he gets an annual checkup and his doctors have been noticing an elevated level of iron in, in, his, in his blood. They were about to put him on dialysis equipment. They had no idea what, what the cause was and they thought his wife was killing him. Wow. With 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 uh, lead uh, with a uh, lead poisoning, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. all because the plumber put in a pressure reducing valve and it's meant for a boiler and not one for that. So, think about that for a second. Is this the noise you're complaining about? Yep. Okay. It gets worse. All right, I believe you. So generally, when you have a noise like this coming from a gas valve, I like to suspect something else is wrong, and I've seen like failed relays. I've seen failed lower cutoffs that are causing that electrical issue right there. But in this case, it's just the gas valve and we'll need to replace it. So, Eli, there is our defective gas valve, all right? It's fairly easy to swap out. And when we're done, we're gonna do something that hardly anyone ever does, and that means we're gonna test combustion with a combustion analyzer to make sure that the new valve we put in is proper, all right? First we do, turn off the gas. Now, I like to use cool stuff when I work on the stuff I work on. So I have this wrench. This is a 3 8 and 7 16 wrench, oh, all right? The 3 8 is perfect for the thermocouple, all right? The 7 16 is perfect for the pilot tubing. It'll work every single time, all right? So we disconnected the pilot tubing, and then we're gonna carefully disconnect the three wires. The three wires are main valve, pilot valve, and main valve pilot valve because we have an intermittent ignition system here. Intermittent ignition means that we spark at for pilot as compared to a standing pilot system which is always on like the water heater. We also have another type of ignition which you'll see in a lot of furnaces called hot surface ignition where you have it looks like the element on a kitchen stove heats up with 110 volts generally and then the gas gets ignited by that hot surface igniter. So the intermittent ignition, hot surface ignition, and standing pilot uh, systems. That's what you'll see. Okay. All right, so we're gonna disconnect those three wires and then we're gonna disconnect the gas. So one of the things that I noticed, right, because a good technician is observant of his surroundings. Before we went to the truck, I noticed that we had half inch in, half inch out. So I made sure that the valve we get can accommodate that. Right, because if I had three quarter in, three quarter out, and I go to the truck, get half inch in, half inch out, now I gotta make another trip back to the truck. All right, so the gas is disconnected, it's going to the valve, the pilot tubing is off to the side, and the three wires that power this thing are also disconnected. Now we're gonna hold back here and use a wrench to take That's this out. That's a great question. You would just ask, what always gonna put it on the side where the wires match up, right? Wrong. The answer is, direction of flow. Oh, okay. Right, it's, it'll always be an arrow on it. You're not gonna find an arrow on a gas valve, for example, on like a gas cock, but you'll always find an arrow on a, a device like this, right? I threw a little pipe dope right there, and we're gonna spin this on like that. Now it does match up, but in some cases, maybe the wiring wasn't there, it's on the other side now. All right, and then you put it in backwards and nothing happens. <laughs> All right, we're gonna tighten this back up with the Nipix channel lock. All right, the valve is on. Let's connect the wiring first. Okay. 
Do you remember which one went where? No, nah, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You may want to get into a habit of taking a picture of what, what, what went where before you disconnect anything. Get into a good habit. It's because otherwise you could spend 20 minutes trying to figure this out. Okay. But fortunately, you're in good hands. If you follow the wiring to the electronic ignition control, you are gonna see that the orange wire goes to MV, the white wire goes to MVPV, and the yellow wire goes to PV. And MV stands for main valve, PV stands for pilot valve, and MVPV, you get it, right? And there's markings on there, which may or may not look like that. But see if you could see what goes where. You may need to take a picture of it. Okay. Next, let's attach the pilot tubing. And I'll give you that little thing right there. Have you worked with gas valves before? No. Okay. So a good rule of thumb is, especially with thermocouples and this um, compression fitting, is that you want it to go in easy by hand. If you're fighting with it, you want to wiggle around the piping a little bit to try to go in more. So you've, it went in fairly well for you. And the, you'll make it nice and tight with the wrench. Right? A lot of times, it, like, and you could easily cross thread it. Okay. So if it's not going in, if not going, the reason why I'm stressing is because if it's not going in easily, you risk cross threading something and now you may have to throw the valve away. Okay. All right, so it, you want it to go in easy. Like in, in this box here, there may even be it. Be it. Is it? Let's see. Yes, there is. So like if I were to take out this pilot tubing, right, and just thread this in, you'll see how nice easy it goes in. Okay. All right, that's the nut and ferrule for the pilot tubing. All right, so let's tighten that up. And then I'll put some dope on the piping, and then we will fire this bad boy up. Gas is on. Gas is connected. We'll leak test later. Turn power on and see what happens. I have a lot of air in there, so it may not ignite the first time around. Okay. Because I didn't, I'm not taking out the cap and purging out air, but we may have to wait for the second retry. There we go. All right, now, now that the gas valve is in and works, and it's quiet, we are going to get rid of some of the garbage, and we're gonna to go to the truck and get two things. We're gonna get the combustion analyzer and the little shop vac, because we're gonna vacuum out. It is a combustion chamber, we've got some dirt in there. It's a little bit of dirt in there, not much. Let's review this test though. Zip it. Yeah, keep going with it. Now, a little bit more. We have to get into this compartment too. All right. This is the Testo 320. We turn it on. Okay. And we have a printer. And we have the probe that's going to sense the flue gases. Okay. And we got some other cool stuff, valve tags that we put on and the important valves like the gas, the water feed, and we do the water here too. Just, you know, added value, I like to deliver. This thing takes a little time to boot up. And did it just die? Yeah, it just died. All right, we need to find power, which we have right there, perfect. Right now it's zeroing out. Now, just technically we should be doing this outside. I'm not concerned about having carbon monoxide in here because I have a Testo carbon monoxide detector on my tool bag. Okay. So if I had, if I knew there was something in here, it would be going off. Okay. So, but it's a rule of thumb to ch plug this in. It might not plug it in, but turn it on outside. Okay. And when you first turn it on, it's gonna zero out. And now the screen comes on. We're at flue gas analysis. We're gonna hit okay. And we're natural gas. If we were other fuels, we would go to that thing, but we do natural gas only. Hit okay again. And now this shows us what the current temperature readings it, sh it shows and this, the current O2 percentages that it's reading. And it's 21% is normal. 
That's what that's what's the in our air right now. Okay. We're gonna hit start and actually it's twenty point nine, but it's running. Right? And we're gonna take this probe and stick it in there. <laughs> In the flue pipe. Yeah, not in the flue pipe. We're gonna stick it in the back of the boiler. Okay. All right. Uh, if we put it into the flue pipe, the, behind the boiler we have a diverter, which is this box right here. This box is open underneath. So if I were to test combustion here, I am getting diluted results. I need to test from inside the boiler. Now normally, like. On a traditional boiler, you have that little, that draft hood that sits on top of the boiler, like attached to the flue pipe. And we drill a hole below that and take a reading there. See, all the way up in there. And now we look at these numbers, okay? The, you wanna take a combustion reading after say 10, 15 minutes of the boiler running, right? Cause you need to let things settle and get the temperature. Traditionally, on a gas system, you're gonna see a T-stack, that's the exhaust temperature. Um, mid threes, usually 375 to like 450. I've seen gas-fired equipment where it's over 600. It's just very, very wasteful. And as long as the other numbers are good, it's safe. But it's hot. You know, basically the boiler's cooking and the, there's no transfer of heat from, on the heat exchanger. Basically, the flames are just going up the chimney. So here, you know, we're probably going to see maybe 420 degrees once this thing really starts to cook and get ready. Uh, O2, we like to see under 9%. I think it's 5 to 9%. I have to double check that. The next levels are PPMCO. So right now, it's showing one part, parts per million of carbon monoxide. It's a whole art of combustion, and I could, you know, I could spend a week. Teach, uh, you know, talking about it, but at the end of the day, a perfect combustion results in zero carbon monoxide. If this boiler was burning at 100% perfectly, you'd have zero. It's like you did first, but second. Seeing that? Yeah, I see it. So that means the gas valve is at 100% where it should be. It doesn't need it to be adjusted. That means that the there's no obstruction in the heat exchanger of the boiler, like soot buildup, things like that. It's not dirty, it's clean. And listen, this is an 80% boiler and it's at 80%, 81, All right? If we find the yellow sticker, if it's still on here, let's see if it's on the other side. That's right there. Technically it's 82%. Yeah, watch that. The yellow sticker says it's rated at 82%. Okay. And we're at that, but it's considered an 80% boiler. Careful of the thing because we're charging. Now, let's get back over here. There's gonna be some other numbers here. You know, we have CO2, we have excess air percentage. Disregard that for now. I'm just, I just want to, just, I want to show you the main primary things I'm looking for, the under 50 of carbon monoxide and make sure I'm under nine of O2. And like I said, like 430, you know, we're climbing maybe 450 at the end of the day. But these results are perfect, perfect, right? So I'm gonna clipboard this. Clipboard uh, saves this so when we print it, we have it. Now I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna escape. I'm gonna go back to the main screen. I'm gonna go to draft measurements. I'm gonna take the probe out behind the boiler. Let's put it off to the side. I do not want to put, lay that like on linoleum floor, carpet, let's say there was carpet in here. That tip is 400 something degrees. You'll burn whatever that's touching that. Especially not even, don't even put it in there. Right now it's just resting on the cement. Let it cool off. We're gonna to go to draft measurement. We're gonna make sure that the boiler has negative draft. Negative draft means it's going up to me like it should. Positive draft means it's not. We're gonna hit okay. Hit okay again. And a quick little story about this. About eight, not about eight, maybe about seven, eight years ago, I was in the market for a new combustion analyzer. I had bought one when I, a couple years into opening my business, right? And the first day I used it, sold the boiler. <laughs> and I've been a firm believer of having the right equipment from the get-go. The first time I used my first combustion analyzer, it was a back rack, right? I think it was like 2,000 bucks, sold the first boiler with it. This thing is like 1,800 bucks, but they don't, they don't make this model anymore. 
But a few years ago, quick little story, I was in the market for a new one. And I was Googling, I came across YouTube, and this one guy, he's from Massachusetts, he's a, a YouTuber, he's got like, I don't know, 100,000 subscribers. He was talking about this. And I was like, this thing is awesome. It's color, co color display, nice numbers. The back rack was stupid. I had, it was LED. It was like, showed just numbers. I had to go through, I had to scroll through like with the buttons and stuff, right? This is so much nicer. But now we're in draft, it's zeroed out. And we're gonna take that probe and shove it back in there where it was before. Just like that. And most cases you have to hold it. This one is just, it's wedged in there. It's not gonna go anywhere. And as you can see, we have the negative sign in front of that. We have negative draft. It normally says negative there, but it's not doing it this time for some reason. And we're gonna let the temperature get up high like it was. It was like 400 something degrees. And then we'll clip you're gonna, it. Like you're gonna go places, I'm telling you. So Eli just asked, what do we do with this printout? Right? We give it to the customer, do we stick it somewhere? And I'm like, oh man, I love it already. I have these little shipping label holders. Right, you see these on packages you get in the mail? And I stick that on the front of the boiler and we put that in there and then every year when we come back we add more to it i love right. how you're asking questions you ask what these do these are main burners all right the gas comes out of these orifices right here these little brass things yeah this is called the gas arm or gas train whatever you want to call it but gas flows through here and it gets pushed out of these little orifices by the pressure of just gas pressure right mm. there's an opening here you see this is open so gas is actually coming out of here mixing with some oxygen in the process and then coming out of all these little slats mm. right and flame comes out of all those little slats okay the gas that is all right um, and we make sure they're always clean so when we do a heating service call or tune-up we generally take them out make sure they're clean clean the combustion chamber which we just did Put it all back together and make sure we fire it up make sure everything's the right way oh, and man. these only go in one way they're annoying on a burnham but you'll see on other boils whale mclean for example very much much easier much much easier oh, and you're going to see some ones that these are actually cast iron and they're like looks like flat plates they're heavy big bulky and they're prone to get dirty and clog up which results in carbon monoxide which is incomplete combustion like oh, we spoke man. about earlier oh. all right so all the burners are back in combustion plate doors back on which contains the if you notice that wire on there and this little device right there yeah that is called the rollout switch oh. and what what it's what its job is is to save the boiler in the event flames are rolling out of the front of it okay. if this boiler was called they call carbonized which results in which came from incomplete combustion you had bad flame and you'll have soot or carbon building up inside the boiler. And the flame and heat can no longer go up anymore. It's gonna to wanna to roll out. Okay. And you'll see older systems that don't have a rollout switch. And in some cases you'll see like this is burnt up there. You're gonna see one if you're around next week, the front of the boiler is orange because the, the heat is cooking it. <laughs> wow. So all the boys don't have certain safeties like this. So that is a flame rollout, uh, roll, roll out switch. Okay. It contains a ceramic thermo disc. It's basically like a resistor, not really, but it's like a, a piece. But once it reaches that temperature, a flame rolled out, it burns out. There's no resetting that. Behind the back of this boiler, right below the damper, if you follow the two wires that are right here, see the two, oh, right here, follow these two wires. Yeah. And that will go to something similar, and that is called oh, yeah, I see. that is called the blocked vent switch, or what we call spill switch. Okay. Picture the, the chimney being clogged, and the exhaust gases are spilling out of the diverter into the confined space, which is the house, right? The condition space, sorry. That is resettable. That's the only one that's resettable here. If the chimney gets clogged, that will turn the boiler off. On newer boilers, uh, like some of the Burnhams, for example, you're gonna they have control the digital displays on them, and it'll say ST. I think it's 15, which is waiting for a limit to close. It's a limit, and it's waiting for it to close to close the circuit. All right. Any questions while we're here? Um, there's one question about this thing. Yeah. That's going into the the gas valve. The gas valve. Yeah. What exactly is this? So that is called the ignition control module. Um, 
it receives 24 volt signal from the boiler through these wires, right? And it's wired, everything's wired and, and all the safeties are wired together as well. If you notice like that roll, that rollout switch is also connected to these wires that come into the vest, uh, the boiler vestibule or okay. under, under the hood as I sometimes refer to. So when the boiler needs to turn on, 24 volts comes into this circuit, right? As long as that safety switch is good, and as long as the one in the back with the spill switch is good, this control will get 24 volts. When this control gets 24 volts, it's gonna cause on spark right there, you're gonna get that tick, 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 tick out of this wire. You can get the voltage out of this wire to ignite the pilot flame. So its job to get 24 volts at a signal to turn the boiler on, send spark to the pilot assembly, the intermittent uh, spark uh, pilot assembly. Once it's, once it's sending spark, it's also sending voltage on PV, pilot valve, to the gas valve, right? And once it senses that flame, it opens MV, PV on there. So its job is to get 24 volts, send spark, send power to gas valve for pilot and then main burner. Any other questions? I think that's it for now. Okay, very good. Don't wanna... Uh, this is like a control panel, basically. That is this basically controls. like the, the computer for the ignition system. Copy. That's all it is. This replaced standing pilots, you know, tw uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, before, like, I don't know, 2003 or two. Before that, boilers came with a standing pilot gas valve. You know, a thermocouple, you light it, hold down for a minute, and there you oh, go. You oh. have a relatively inexpensive part that is your ignition system. Okay. All right? And it's simple. It either works or it doesn't. They want it to become more energy efficient, so they added this very expensive control to save customers maybe 40 to $60 a year in pilot savings. Okay. Because pilot always being on costs money. That's, that's gas, right? It's fuel. And uh, think about it. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's, uh, you know, maybe $60 a year in gas. Depends okay. on where you live. But so they, they added that. All right. Cool. Um, all right, I think we're good here. We did a combustion test. There's the results. We put on valves tags on the gas, the water, the boiler feed valve. There's our service record. We took a look at this water heater. We put a valve tag on the gas for that. I am not putting my sticker on that. Normally we put our stickers on the stuff that we tag, but I am not going to be associated with that disaster right there, especially with the, that. <laughs> we say shoemaker, right? All right, so I, I believe in giving my customers the best bang for their buck. Uh, I like to, you know, when warranted, you know, you, you're paying for an hour, you're getting an hour's worth of service. Uh, we did a quick little tune-up. There's more we, we could do, but it's up to you if you want us to spend more time here. We took all the burners out. They were dirty. We vacuumed the combustion chamber um, to clean. The, uh, we did a combustion test, perfect combustion, zero parts per million of carbon monoxide. Perfect O2 percentage, CO2, everything's perfect. Um, and again, it's running fine. You know, there's other things that maybe, I don't know how often you drain the boiler, but uh, drain the boiler once a month during the winter. Make sure the low water cutoff turns off the boiler. Um, and I don't know, when's the last time the boiler was serviced? When's the last time the pigtail was clean, things like that. But um, overall, it's a very clean system. A couple of dislikes, you know, it's not properly laying level on the floor, which is kind of like upsetting, but I guess, you know, when you have cast iron, cast iron circulators on your domestic cold water, you know, I guess. <laughs> you know, you're gonna get a lot of heat for this, by the way. <laughs> the flex, you know, it is what it is. You know, the, fle the, the flexible uh, uh, supply lines on water heaters and, and the gas flex, listen, if you were in California, earthquake zone, this is code. You also need the hurricane, the earthquake straps as well on the water heater, but this is what they have in other parts of the country. Here, it's, it's just like, this is a, Huge, 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 like fail. <laughs> You're right. Like an inspector saw this, you know, he would probably, it would get, you know, he would plant that, you know, that sign in the front of your house, like, do not enter. <laughs> but, uh, oh, just gotta go in there. Um, but other than that, when's the last time you drained the boiler? Um, I think it was like three weeks ago. Okay, very good. Other than that, you know, everything else is fine. You know? So you don't think it's like over right? No, it's running perfectly. Right, perfectly. Yeah. But I do, I do want to replace that. Um, I don't know. The what? You're going to have to give me a quote to replace the, the internal copper pipe. Okay. You want to go do it all in two inch? Yeah. 
Okay. What? Okay. The hard, the, the the hardest part again. The boilers from two thousand. What was this? Two thousand and two thousand thirteen. So you have an, an eight year old boiler. You know the bushing that's in that corner. I may not want to come out with without uh, you know some brute force. And that's the unknown. The other side there, that corner. So they have the copper going into the boiler right there. Yeah. So, like yesterday, I, I had to rebuild the steam trim off a steam boiler because the, the safety circuit just was wired totally wrong. And the pigtail was going right into the side of the boiler, and they put the bushing into the boiler. I broke out a 24-inch pipe wrench after taking off the cover of this to get a three-quarter by quarter-inch bushing out with a 24-inch pipe wrench. Here is inch and a quarter copper going into an inch, a two by inch and a quarter uh, uh, cast iron bush, uh, bushing, which I may need a 36 inch with a, with a, a, ha uh, with a sledgehammer to break free. But, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch it because if you break that tapping on the side of the boiler, you're screwed. Think of that, you're screwed. You know, and now you replace a boiler or try to seal that up and re-tap re it somewhere else. Not worth it, you know, not worth it. No, nah, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't pay, doesn't pay. Listen, it's been installed for eight years. If it's a problem having the smaller equalizer than normal, if it's a problem, then let's change it. If it's not a problem, don't touch it, don't touch it. Eventually, hopefully you're not here, this boil will get replaced, and then make the changes at that point. Cool? Uh, decide what you, what you, what you want to do with the service plans? Um... Thirty-five dollars a month parts and labor, or twenty dollars a month you get, you know, you get to see me once a year. Now, do I have to pay that upfront, or it's it's, it's monthly? billable monthly? Okay. So if you want the maintenance plan, you give me your credit card information. Tomorrow morning, the system automatically charges you nineteen ninety-five. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, if yeah. you want the parts and labor, whatever the I think it's thirty-five dollars and change. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow morning, and every tomorrow's the, the sixth, so every sixth of every month, your card gets charged that amount. Okay. And next year, you know, September October. Uh, we'll come for the, the tune-up. Okay. All right? Yeah. So let me know. You want parts and labor or you want the maintenance? Uh, so 35 with, with the parts and labor. Right? Okay. Very good. Yeah. We'll get sign you up. All right. I hope you enjoyed that video. Hope you found it somewhat educational and maybe, maybe just a little bit entertaining. What was entertaining for me and for... Oh, man. Damn with the name. Ellie, right? Uh, Eli. So, damn it. <laughs> what was entertaining for me was seeing that Taco 0015 cast iron circulator on the guy's domestic cold water supply line, hanging with pecs, with those steel pipe clamps, holding that circulator there that he uses for recirculating hot water. As, fuck it, the damn name. <laughs> I'm just gonna call you E. As E said, shoemaker work, damn straight it is, Hackery at its finest. And the client's response when I said, listen, you know, you can cast iron your water. They're like, well, I don't drink the hot water. <laughs> if you want version 3.0 hacks, bring me stack stickers, email me, mike at mikeypipes.com. Details in the description box down below. Be well, God bless, stay safe, have a great right, weekend. I haven't went into that closet yet, but I just noticed the problem. So right away, you want to take a just a quick guess? Valve is shut. Yes! Now, mm. let's feel that pipe. It may take a little while. We may have some air as well, which we do. Yeah, it's getting hot. Perfect. All right, this is called a strap-on aquastat. When, it, when the temperature in this pipe is at that set point, the circulator either turns on or off. I thought this was hooked up to that, but it's not. This is a little temperature clamp right there. We'll turn on the blower inside the air handler. So it's a lot of heat. Okay. We are scheduled to come here next week to resolve. Teep, pay me. <laughs> All right. So you may ask like, well, Mike, how did you handle this one? Did you really charge her an hour? Well, the answer is I didn't lie to her, but I didn't tell her the valve was closed. 
What I did tell her was that the boiler was not circulating water to the fan coil on our air handler, which prevented the heat from heating her home, right? So we restored circulation and made sure that the system was okay. And I gave her a discount off the normal hourly rate. And could I have went there for free and charged another thing? I could have, but listen, if it was on my route and I was just on my way to another job and a call came in, I probably would have just chalked it up and gave her a freebie, but she's in Long Beach, right? I have to go over a bridge to get there. And it's, it's not on the way to some other job. I'm specifically going to her and then going somewhere else. So at least an hour round trip in travel. So she paid accordingly, but we gave her heat, made her nice and warm. So doing the thing, getting it done. All right, talk to you later.